right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Becca Toms, and I am a communications coordinator over at UConn Extension uh, with the Solid Ground program. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, our Solid Ground program is specifically a program that is targeted to new and beginning farmers in Connecticut to try to prepare them for the experience of farming that is ahead of them, um, giving them skills and um, making connections among other farmers as well. So um, today's webinar is brought to you by not only Yukon and Solid Ground, but also uh, the Dep Department of Ag. This was done by a grant from the USDA um, and the Department of Ag in Connecticut is partnering with us to put these webinar series on um, and help us talk about the stress that is our lives as farmers. So um, yeah, a uh, little bit about me. Again, I'm communications coordinator uh, with uh, Solid Ground, but also I am a part-time farmer, um, if you can call it that, uh, working at a farm in Woodbridge. So. Um, excited to explore this topic with you. Uh, before we get started, uh, we like to start all of our um, webinars and everything like that with a land acknowledgement. And the reason that we do that is um, a land acknowledgement is really, it's like a formal statement that recognizes and respects that Native peoples were and are the traditional stewards of the lands that we're on. Um, which is especially important uh, when we're talking about being farmers, you know, a lot of this has to do with land. So um, a land acknowledgement statement really highlights the enduring relationship between Native peoples and their traditional territories. So we always try to start our uh, webinars and workshops with a land acknowledgement. So this is something that um, was worked on with some Native peoples and uh, Yukon to try to um, just show some respect for the land that we're on. So um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pogasset, Nipmuc, and La Lanape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. So uh, in addition to that, um, this is a map of our, our general area of the country. Um, and we encourage you, uh, there's a really great website here called nativeland.ca. Um, and it's a really great place you can put in where you are and it will help you um, zone in as to where uh, the land that you're from, uh, the, the native peoples that originally stewarded that land. So we encourage you to go ahead and took, take a look at that if you'd like, nativeland.ca. Uh, in addition to that, we also want to uh, talk about Land Grab Connecticut. So um, you may or may not know that Yukon is a land grab, uh, sorry, <laughs> not a land, it's a land grant um, university. Um, so it means that some of the lands that um, were on and some of the land, the sell of lands that um, happened throughout the country actually helped fund and start Yukon. So um, just wanted to show you this website and just talk about how it's important to understand that the colonialism is an ongoing process that we need to understand our place in that past history as well as the present context. So, um, you know, with the land grant project, it highlights an 1862 piece of legislation known as the Morrill Act which was set up to donate public lands to several states and territories, which may provide colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. 
These public lands were established by the systematic and often violent dispossession of indigenous peoples by the United States government. The colleges established benefited white citizens then, and that many institutions continue to disproportionately benefit white citizens today. The land tied to Yukon's land grant status spans 12 states originally stewarded by indigenous tribes, as you can see on this map here. The University of Connecticut became Connecticut's land grant college in 1893. As such, the University of Connecticut directly benefited from close to 180,000 acres of land for which the state of Connecticut paid close to 12,000 for the land scripts and received close to 135,000 in return, along with annual interest payments paid to the university that continues to this day. So again, encourage you to go ahead and check out landgrabct.org and learn a little bit more about that. And um, yeah, learn a little bit about the history of the lands that we're farming on and um, very close to in our occupation. Um, last little plug. Um, this is the first sort of event in a three part series. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be having something called Farm Talk, a conversation with Connecticut farmers. Uh, that's going to be with Steve Mono from Masaro Farm in Woodbridge. Lauren Little from the I Got Next Farmer Collaborative that's uh, coming out of Hartford and Andromeda Makri uh, from Rivercrest Farm in Milford. That's going to be a good one. And then also on March 8th, what it's like, what to expect if you want to see a therapist. So I know I just threw out the word therapist. It can be really scary, but um, that's going to be something where it's actually going to be me and uh, a licensed uh, therapist talking about what it's like to actually go into therapy. Um, and I'll be sharing some of my experiences as someone who has attended therapy and has benefited from it. So um, definitely give those a look. There's also these other wonderful events coming up. Um, that's part of our solid ground programming. Uh, and all of that can be signed up for at newfarms.yukon.edu slash solid ground. Um, and I will put that in the chat. But now I am going to stop talking because we have the wonderful Jen Salonetti here. And um, she's from a Woven Roots Farm in Tiringham, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I, I basically, I was looking for someone to talk about farms not being perfect. <laughs> and uh, was wandering around the internet and found this wonderful TED talk that Jen gave and then had some further conversations with her and really felt like she uh, could speak to the heart of this and just some of the stressors that we deal with um, on the everyday experience of being farmers. So um, Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little yeah. bit about you. Sure, sure. Um, thank you so much, Becca. It's really a pleasure to be able to share this time and space with, with you and all the participants that are here, um, it, uh, specifically about this really um, relevant and necessary topic that we sometimes tend to steer away from. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, I will um, say that my name is Jen Salonetti. I am um, co-founder and director of education and community engagement, as well as a farmer at Woven Roots Farm and Education Center. We are located here um, on the unceded land of the Mohegan people. Um, so we're close in proximity, um, just bordering um, where Becca is and where Becca was just speaking to. And um, I appreciate that acknowledgement that was given and, and the historical context that was um, given to, to the land acknowledgement. Um, and, and also speak and want to just uplift um, how important it is to be in relationship with um, the indigenous people of the land that we occupy, um, specifically as farmers, um, but just as um, 
you know, people that are, you know, earth tenders and, um, and we have a responsibility to do that. Um, so not only to acknowledge, but also to, to find that historical context to understand and to speak of that historical context. Um, and to recognize all of the threads um, to the both the colonizer mindset and the forced you know dispossession dislocation that happened to indigenous people that bring us to this very place of um, experiencing stress as farmers so i hope that we can weave that into our conversation tonight in different ways um so i'm in the present day berkshires western massachusetts um, in a town called tearingham um, that is, uh, and I've been here, I've been farming specifically on this land for um, eight years, nine years, sorry, we're in our ninth year, and I have been farming for 21 years. Um, and so there have been various stresses that have come, you know, just in being able to have access to land to begin with. Um, and in that time, those initial years, um, we started out as just a small a market garden essentially um that grew into you know we had a farm stand and we had a, um, a handful of people that started to attend that farm stand and uh and then we started to listen to both um the interests and the needs of of the community and that has you know grown into a um a full production farm and education center we have um we have seven um um staff that work you know with us um throughout the season and we are working towards being able to have um more of our crew be available year or um be able to work with us year round um so there's seven of us that tend to the earth together here um we have we are a really small scale hand scale um farm so we do not rely on fossil fuels um we have a permanent bed system that um is very focused on successive crop production and um and guiding principles that help us to tend to the earth. And so that permanent bed system and the intensive quality of how we're growing um, allows us to on an acre and a third of land feed about a thousand people per week. Um, we have, uh, we are a CSA, um, which uh, if you don't know that stands for community supported agriculture. So people buy um, shares in advance of the season and, um, and we have about two, so there's 200 shares and that makes up um, almost two thirds of our business. And then the other third is through um, wholesale partnerships that we have locally. And um, this is a space for education and knowledge sharing and um, space, space, safe space for marginalized community members, a place for land connection, reacculturation, um, and yeah, so I, I, I'm sure more will come up about my farm as I'm speaking with you, but that's a little overview. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, Jen. Um, so, I mean, even just hearing you speak about all the different components of your farm and all of the, the different um, things that are important to your farm, um, you know, not just growing things, like there's so much to your farm business that is beyond tending the land. It's also tending people, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, one of the reasons I, I thought of this topic was because uh, I go around the state talking to different farmers in Connecticut and um, I hear a lot of stories uh, from farmers who are doing really amazing work, tending to the land, caring about the people that they work with, caring about the communities that they're feeding. And they, they look at their, their businesses and they look at their, um, you know, their farms and they're always comparing themselves or they're always putting mm -hmm. themselves down saying, oh my gosh, don't, don't look at my fields right now. There's so many weeds over there. <laughs> or I wish I was like this other farm. 
can you, I, I mean, seriously, what, how do they do that? Um, <laughs> and I mean, not to say that that's something that they, sh- we, we don't all do <laughs> and that it's on some level, okay to strive yeah. towards that. Um, but there's also this, this component of sometimes we are trying too hard to achieve that perfect farm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you think, um, you know, did you struggle a little bit with, with trying to make your farm perfect? Um, and how did you come to grips with that? I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure it's not a completely, uh, closed book and that you have all of that <laughs> solved but um was there a real a moment where you realized oh, I'm being too hard on myself I have to stop having this kind of mindset um yeah. so can you tell us a little bit about that yeah um I think for um for me what has led um both you know my business and my my engagement within my business has 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 really always been led by by the heart and so you know when i think about different aspects of struggle i realize that that is often when i am not taking the moments to to really check in with myself and 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 come from a place of gratitude and come from a place of of recognition of of how much it means to be connected in community and so you know when um when i'm when i think back to when i first started farming and um you know my partner and i were looking for um for land you know that that was a it was a huge struggle to be working within compromised space um you know and to and to see that there sometimes it felt like we were never going to be able to get beyond that you know and and i have the privilege to be able to actually have ownership on land i also um, we rent land that's adjacent to it, and that's it's a huge privilege, you know. So that struggle, um, which shifted nine years ago, was something that you know I sat with for you know it was like fourteen years total of really trying to figure out okay if this is something that I truly believe in and we believe in and we know is for the greater good of our community, how can we actualize this? And that struggle was was terrifying and totally. Um, demoralizing at times you know i mean looking at um the land prices and you know what it meant to be having land price for development seeing that priorities within zoning weren't necessarily accessible to farmers um seeing that there um that people were were thinking in in a in a short-sighted way not thinking about you know the future the future of the community and what it meant to be um sustainable and that you know that became an inner struggle because i knew within my heart i knew within um within speaking to the needs of um of of others that this was something our community both needed and deserved and um but yet the land access component was um was a barrier. Um, so I have the privilege to not say that anymore. Um, and it has been um, a, a tremendous shift in my struggle um, since then. And then with then having the land access, um, I the next piece of struggle became lack of infrastructure. It was like, okay, we have the land. And so then how do we actually start to develop infrastructure and keep a farming operation going and, you know, make the make ends meet to be able to maintain, you know, this land <laughs> that we have the privilege to now own. And so, you know, um, a lot of my struggles have been based then or more recently within this lack of infrastructure. And so um, you know, working with just compromised um, situations this past year when we just had 32 inches of rain in the month of July, yeah. um, you know, we set up planks to be able to access our cooler because there was just so much mud um, everywhere, you know, and, and thinking about um, how to keep our farm crew safe and, um, you know, dealing with, um, with the elements was... Um, and does continue to be, you know, a struggle in many ways. Um, that being said, we've been really um, 
engaging in shifting that narrative around infrastructure. We are um, engaged in a collaborative fundraiser right now with um, uh, with a way to be able to see a, a path forward of really being able to develop the infrastructure that we need to support the community. Um, what and then other pieces of struggle that I that I really felt. I mean, I certainly felt isolation um, at first. You know, that was something that. Um, yeah, it just, I felt alone a lot, you know, and my, my partner and I w felt alone a lot. And even, even though we were, and continue to, um, to grow our business together, a lot of times we have been, you know, um, siloed and we're do, we're working in, on different aspects of the business. So even though technically we're, we're, we're working together all day long, we, we often didn't even see each other very much. And so, you know, managing both, um, a uh, business partnership and a life partnership um, has been a struggle at times. Um, and certainly when we were doing that alone, um, when it was just, you know, before we had other people join us, um, which I can bring in as like a benefit of reducing some of the struggle. Um, what other pieces? Um, you know, that feeling of being able, uh, or the need to be, not only able to do, but almost be an expert at everything, you know, even though I was like, okay, so I, my passion is in growing food and, you know, tending to the earth. And so I'm, you know, I'm honing, I honed in on all of those skills in order to be able to actualize farming as a career. And then it was like, oh, okay. And I need to be an accountant. I need to be a carpenter. I need to be a mechanic. I need to be oh my goodness, what else? Uh, you know, a, a, an employer, you know, I have to be um, good at communications. I need to, you know, all these different components where it was, you know, marketing, all these things that I was like, wait, this is what we signed up for? This is, <laughs> you know, and, and so um, that piece has been a huge struggle. And then also a joy to shift that, you know, a joy to be able to really step into the collaborative process of farming, um, really um, recognizing when help um, was needed. I mean, I guess I recognized it and then it took a little bit of time before I actually did something about getting help, um, which comes into those, you know, parameters of, um, that need of you know feeling perfect <laughs> in some ways you know and so yeah I think I feel like there's more I could say to that but we'll let that be the, the landing yeah. point yeah um I'm just going to take a moment real quick because I forgot to do this in the beginning so apologies again I'm not perfect <laughs> um uh there is a, a Q and a uh, component on y'all's uh, little Zoom tab here, and if uh, at any point during the webinar you have something that you would like us to talk about, feel free to put that in the Q&A um, box, and we will get to those um, either at the end or as we're going along, but uh, we definitely want to hear from you if there's something that uh, really you kind of cling to and want to hear more about. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we're hearing your voices. So, um, so I hear you talking about all of these experiences and it sounds like the really pivotal point for you was, um, you know, making that decision that you need, needed to hire people. <laughs> um, yeah. But also, it took a little while to get to that point where you could hire people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some of our farmers, um, while they're striving to do all the things that you just listed off and more, um, <laughs> um, you know, we don't always have the, the capacity to, to bring someone on, unfortunately, as we're trying to develop our businesses. So, I guess, um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, working in that environment where you're like, I know I need people, but we're not ready to bring those people on. Like, how did you deal with um, 
that waiting and that knowing that you you can't do all that you need to do but you're still gonna push on yeah um that makes sense (laughs) yeah no it does I mean I think um I mean in a lot of ways I didn't deal with it very well you know I mean I think that uh you know I was a I was a young mother at that point and um I was you know committed to being able to be present for my for my children and um and you know would recognize on a regular basis that that um there was um a cost to my well-being that um that I was sacrificing and it didn't feel good um it didn't feel good at all actually you know and so um I really I think what I can think of like one of the things that helped me was that um, one of the first places where I really asked for help, um, although actually I didn't even ask for it. So I was, (laughs) I was, I I manage all of the finances of the business. And so, um, so I'm, you know, the one that's, you know, looking at all the numbers constantly, I'm seeing the ebb and flow of it. I'm, I'm, I I can recognize these you know <laughs> peaks and valleys and I would go from year to year just in and I and I was always responding to finances in this um Oh my goodness, I forgot what I would say. It was like, I would have to like emergency pay bills. It was like, I, I, you know, like these are all due. I have to stop. I have to go do this right now um, or else, you know, we're not going to have electricity. And it was that kind of, you know, that urgency, which is so, um, so problematic. And so I, um, I was really falling apart with that. And I was very afraid. I couldn't necessarily, I was so in it that I couldn't necessarily step back to, to really see those ebbs and flows and go, oh yeah, every year around this time, money gets really tight and we're in this period. And then, you know, oh, and then we start to have, we, the, the harvest starts to begin and we have a cash flow that, um, that begins again. And so it was like, I would feel it on this core level, but I wasn't actually tracking it in any oh. visual way. And, um, and I, there was a, um, a workshop that was around, that was about accounting for farmers that was um, offered by a local ag organization by Berkshire Grown. And I just was like, I don't even know if I could show up to something like that. Our, our finances are a mess. I barely, I barely can keep afloat with them. I don't want to show anybody that, you know, that feeling of you know, perfectionism where it was like, I'm too embarrassed to show anybody the IRS might knock at my door any day now. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and my partner was like, this is, you know, I see you in tears about this. You know, we have, something has to shift. We have to, you know, I think if you go to this workshop, you're going to learn something from this. And sure enough, I mean, the first person that I essentially hired to work with was an accountant. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was one of the most um, illuminating moments for me. You know, I was able to sit down with somebody who understood historicals, understood projections, um, could help me see those ebbs and flows, could help me anticipate change, could help me, um, make some sound business decisions, um, so that I could hire somebody to come work with me. So that maybe that fear of that there's not enough, that scarcity feeling was, could be put into, on paper in a way that, all of a sudden didn't feel so scarce. And um, I hadn't, I didn't think I, it would be, it's nice to reflect on that because I didn't really, um, I was in crisis at that time. I definitely was, you know, um, and, and from the outside, you know, our, you know, our business was, our business was growing and, you know, we were just providing more food access and, um, you know, but internally on a day-to-day basis, it was, um, something needed to shift. And so, um, I didn't, I want to say I didn't wait too long, but I definitely waited too long because I was, no, nobody should have to struggle like that, you know, but it's that asking for help yeah. that, um, that, be, that, that initial asking for help has continued to make it easier to ask for help and to both, and to recognize that we're just not meant to be doing this alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And uh, just speaking specifically to that financial component, I just want to 
speak out the carrot project which is uh, based out of Boston. And I'm gonna put uh, their link in the chat here. Um, you know, again, something else that I often hear farmers say, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed about my budget. Um, yeah. It's such a mess or, or whatever uh, about their financials. And, um, you know, that is huge. Asking for someone to look in on your finances with you, it can be super intimidating, <laughs> but mm -hmm. it can also change everything. So yeah. um, I'm yeah. just gonna shout out the carrotproject.org. And then also I wanna shout out uh, real quick because we're talking to Connecticut farmers here. Um, hey. mm -hmm. We do have uh, a resource through the New Connecticut Farmers Alliance through a project that we're working on with them mm. called Farmer Circles. And one of those Farmer Circles is about um, financial management, uh, like looking at numbers with other farmers and trying to figure out how to deal with your financials. So uh, I'm also going to put the link to that in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in that group or any of the other farmer circles there, uh, feel free to give that a look and you're always welcome to join any of those groups. Um, so thanks, That's Jen. amazing. That's <laughs> yeah. amazing. Great resources. That's yeah. so <laughs> thanks for letting me interrupt to drop those in. Um, you know, those we, we may bring up some other stuff. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I also know that you and I talked a little bit before about, um, you know, there are some extra barriers and expectations put on you because you are a farmer of color, because you're a female farmer. And that uh, leads to some extra challenges. And, um, you know, I, I definitely want to give space for um, sharing about that because, you know, that's, that's something that some of our farmers in Connecticut deal with. Um, and also I think even if uh, people listening aren't farmers of color that they need to be aware of so that we mm. can learn because I think part of the solution to the um, finding our successes is also finding people to lift us up and to support um, us which includes fellow farmers. So um, just want to make sure that, you know, uh, we, we talk about that, the fact that mm -hmm. there are many experiences that uh, our different farmers are having. So um, yeah, would you be willing to, to talk about some of those things? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, thank you for leaving space for that. I feel like, um, Sometimes it, it's, uh, I mean, it's sometimes hard to separate um, um, components of that. You know, I think that, um, you know, over the last 20 years as, um, as a farmer in this area and really, you know, growing into um, my role within the community, I have... Um, I can reflect on how much I um, have had to um, make my presence known and, you know, and, I, and be willing to put myself in situations where I potentially and often did experience and do, you know, experience harm in that process. Um, you know, and that, you know, when, when there are, conver you know, community conversations that are happening, happening, you know, a lot of times, you um, in a predominantly white com community, um, you know, I, I, you know, speaking from my own experience, you know, I, I'm an oversight, I'm, you know, on the sidelines in a way that, you know, I've had to put myself out there in order to be seen and heard. Um, and then sometimes when I am speaking, you know, from my own experience, then, um, then I become, you know, like too loud or impolite or, um, you know, I'm taking up space. And so that's something that I navigate all the time, you know, in a way that I, um, and part of my own self-care to, to recognize that, you know, I have a right to take up space. I have, um, I deserve to be seen and heard. Um, and I, 
actively work to have, you know, allies and co-conspirators around me to be able to uplift that, like you said, you know, that like finding, and I try not to have it be something that I put a lot of effort to. I, I hope that I surround myself with community that will, you know, take on that, that role and responsibility of saying, oh, you know, it's who, who's not in the room right now, you know, who, who's not here having a conversation. Oh, there are, you know, there really aren't any, um, BIPOC farmers in, in our community. Why is that? And what can we do, um, you know, as individually and community members to make that better? And what does it mean when there is, um, a, you know, a BIPOC farmer, um, or, and, 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 or a woman farmer, you know, in the community, how, how can we, um, how can we show up in a way that's supportive and in recognition of um, the historical oppression, the historical struggle that comes with that and create a place of, of care, you know? And so um, I think, uh, and I, you know, I, I, re I work you know hard to to, to recognize that um you know going back to that place of like deserving you know that recognizing that the 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 struggle that so often happens within farming and that need to be or that feeling of needing to be perfect really comes from this greater system of oppression yeah. right you know so it's like when we think about the white industrial complex when we think about what white supremacy culture, you know, it's like all of these components um, do not feed and nourish any of us, whether we are a person of color or not. And, you know, that, that drive for perfectionism is not part of, you know, our, our origins. It's just, it's not, you know, that the feelings of feel, uh, being isolated, the feeling of, you know, that individualism that like, I have to pull myself up by my bootstraps and figure this out alone. You know, that rugged individualism is not part of our origins. You know, it's not part of mine. It's not part of your, it's not part of any of ours really, you know? And so what does it mean for us as like individuals to, be breaking down those barriers, be breaking, you know, recognizing the systems of oppression that are holding all of us down and see them as systems and not something that's like an individual choice by, you know, by one person or another. Um, and the more we can see that and the more we can get comfortable about having conversations about that, the more we can uplift one another and, um, and break those barriers. And so, you know, I can see my relationship with uh, perfectionism changed as I, you know, just coincide that with doing work on actively dismantling racism, mm -hmm. you know, and the oppressions within myself, within my community, within this country, you know, it's, it's really, they all go hand in hand. And I couldn't have necessarily said that even 10 years ago, I would not have necessarily seen that, you know, but that's like part of the active work that I do now um, to show up better for myself and for the community. And I think it's actually a huge component of how we can help break that stigma of per the need to be perfect um, within our lives. Thank you. That's, that was really powerful, by the way. I really appreciate you <laughs> speaking those words. Um, because, yeah, um, I mean, we could have a whole separate webinar on, on where the roots of perfectionism comes from <laughs> and how, um, you know, uh, there are systems that are in place that are definitely harming um, farmers of color, but also harming all of us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you speaking that. Um, so we spent a little bit of time talking about the struggles and um, kind of the clawing our way through <laughs> that is farming. Um, but I want to sort of shift the conversation a little bit now um, and talk about what a successful farm is. Um, mm. You know, that's... I think that's something that we forget as farmers to pause and recognize, like sitting down and saying, okay, what does it mean for my farm to be successful? Because every, everybody's answer is going to be different. But um, I guess, what do you think 
is a successful farm, you know, um, mm -hmm. I would love to hear your answer. So it could be uh, twofold if you'd like. Uh, what do you consider a successful par farm overall? And then also, mm -hmm. I definitely would love to hear your personal um, kind of thought about what do you feel is a successful farm for you? Mm, okay. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a, it's a interesting question. It's a loaded question in some ways, yeah. you know, because it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I mean, so, maybe we should start with what does success mean, <laughs> you know? Right, what, right, yeah, what does success mean? I mean, I think, yeah, that's what I come back to because I, yeah. I think that they're, you know, again, you know, like with the, um, recognition that white dominant culture uh success is is measured with with money right yeah, with finance yeah, yeah. and so it's kind of interesting that I was speaking about you know finances being the strain you know and then and being able to have that be something that um that I've learned to work with and not necessarily um and not have it be something that controls me yeah. you know and so I think um, you know, when I think about measuring success, I think about, um, I think about how my heart feels, you know, I think about how I feel when I wake up in the morning and how I feel when I go to bed at night and how I have contributed um, to, to my community, how I have um, been a better steward, you know, it, it, am I being a steward to, to the land? Um, I think about what it means to be in exchange um, with all beings, you know, it's like the, and I, and I, and, and yes, I think about what it means to also be able to pay my electric bill. <laughs> so, you know, like that, that does come in, into it as well, but it's a piece of it. And so I think that that was a shift for me where it was like making, what does it mean to make ends meet? Is it, you know, we do have to have a certain amount within this system that we are operating in. We do, money has to be a piece of it, but it's not the only measure of success at all. You know, I think, and I really um, think about what you, how I'm contributing um, as an individual, how, how my business is contributing to the community. Um, I keep track of, or not keep track of, but, you know, I, I hold close those, those notes of appreciation, those pictures that are drawn, those um, emails that I get, the, you know, the, those are, those are, they're sacred testaments to my success, you know, and our success as a business. Um, when I think about um, people's, people's lives literally being changed by, you know, the, the food that they are now um, consuming, that they have learned to um, incorporate into their lives because of the education and knowledge sharing that we offer. You know, that's a success to me when I hear that, you know, somebody has literally changed their entire lifestyle because they now have access to the food that we are providing. Um, that's a huge success. You know, I think about when I see people walking barefoot on the farm or taking a moment to notice the hawk that goes by, you know, that's a success. Um, any moment to, to where somebody can slow down a bit and check in with themselves and, and recognize their interconnectedness is a success to me. Um, so, yeah, I kind of push back on 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 those, you know, what the, those measurements, you know, of or maybe what somebody else might consider to be a success, you know, does it mean that, um, you know, every tool has an exact place that it, um, you know, belongs? Not yet necessarily, you know, but if <laughs> you know, um, is my, you know, but is my does my farm crew feel like they're you know being seen and heard and that they're, you know, contributing to something and that if they show up and they're um, not in a great headspace, there's room to be able to have that kind of conversation or to move a little bit slower or to um, go home early, you know, if that's what's needed in that moment, you know, that's, 
that's success, you know, is that if, if I have, you know, people in my lives that feel safe enough to be able to say that to me, I measure that as success. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, yeah, it's a, it's a piece of it. You know, I think, um, I think, you know, I can also think about like systems that that um that we have put in place you know i think that that does help with measuring success in some ways you know it's just like as we as we talk about dismantling systems of repression we <laughs> also are thinking about these systems that um that we can create to bring ease to our minds so that and and to our bodies you know so that the actions that we take on a day-to-day -day basis are um maybe not so cumbersome you know, so those are ways, like, as we fine-tune those systems over the years, that becomes a measure of success as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you were saying, looking back at your financials and seeing the ebb and flow, like, mm -hmm. to me, that sounds like being able to, to recognize successes because of being able to keep records. And I'm not saying that because you keep perfect records, you are now successful. No. That's <laughs> obviously not what I'm saying, but, um, you know, we all have little tools that we're already doing yeah. that can serve as natural indicators for us right. that if we pause long enough and look at them, those can be our, our compasses mm -hmm. for success. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I want to, I want to emphasize that when I say success, uh, I by no means mean financial or, um, you know, how many people sign up for your CSA or how lauded you are among the farming community. Like, I think that that's the, the perfectionism mm. that um, we turn that definition towards. But really, success is something that you hold yourself as an achievement whatever mm -hmm. that may be um and you know recognizing the achievements that you make so mm -hmm. for instance just thinking about um you know my time on the farm <laughs> there is a time and season where i am doing a lot of broad forking and mm -hmm. it is very tiring <laughs> and being able to look over an area and see that I have broad forked the area that I have designated to right. be broad forked mm -hmm. like if I stop in that moment and look at that space and feel my body mm -hmm. that to me is something that I can recognize as a success because mm -hmm. Yes, my body may feel like crap, <laughs> but, but look what I did. Like, right. this, is, this is something hard that I accomplished. Just mm -hmm. like going through the financials and putting them in yeah. front of somebody and looking for help. That's also another indicator of success and achievement. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. And then I take that uh, even a step further now with, you know, when I'm broad working or working with others um broad forking now it's like we look back and we see um we can we can see that success behind us and then we pause and we stretch <laughs> so that we don't yes. feel <laughs> so <laughs> lousy <laughs> yeah. you know and just taking those <laughs> like and that's like you know taking that moment of appreciation and then extending that further into you know self-care has been something that is much more recent in my doings, you know, but it's, um, but it certainly is like a way to just pat ourselves on the back a little bit, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I just got through, you know, broad forking these, you know, 15 beds, and now I can, you know, pause and replenish a little bit, you know, and um, so then those successes become, you um, like a reciprocal relationship, you know, we're doing something that's good for the land and we're doing something good for ourselves as well in those moments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, we're talking a little bit about, um, you know, what are the successes and taking time to identify them and celebrate 
our achievements and things like that. Um, I mean, I don't want to go from the assumption that, you know, everybody recognizes right away that this is important. Mm. So, <laughs> um, because people watching this may not really understand what we're talking about. <laughs> so I guess um, it's not just, uh, you know, talking about how it's important, not just for um, yourself, but for your business, um, mm. for your customer base, even like, why is it important for us as farmers to be able to take those moments to recognize achievement and success for our personal well-being, for our business's well-being, for the community's well-being? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we get to reflect back to um to the community that that those shifts some of those shifts and priorities you know i actually well sometimes it can be um a little bit um demanding on me i love being able to have those moments where i am you know writing a, a newsletter to my csa members a weekly update or you know i'm i'm seeing somebody um to be able to have a conversation and be very real about how I'm doing, you know, like yeah. really, truly answering that question about, you know, how, how am I, um, you know, we get to model that for, for our community. We get to, um, you know, I always think about, you know, how closely we were working with, with the weather and how often people aren't thinking about weather if they mm. don't have a job that's working yeah. with the weather. And so, you know, sometimes like that will just be this, a little bit of a reflection. And then, you know, I get to expand on that and be able to say, um, you know, something that, that that's meaningful to me in that moment or something that um, brings that, that pause that, and we get to reflect that. We, I get to reflect that as a, as you know, someone who's employing people, I get to reflect that, um, you know, within within my community and those conversations, or when I'm at town meetings and things like that. You know, there's just like there's that room to be able to say, you know, the reality is is that there's there's never enough time in the day. There's never enough weeks in the year. You know, it's like our work. Um, particularly, I mean, I, I, I have the privilege of living where I farm. And so, you know, it's a privilege and sometimes it can be a huge challenge because everything is right out my door right. all the time, you know, so I never step away from it. And so I've had to really condition, recondition myself to, um, to, to stop, to take that pause and say, okay, this is, this is my long list. I'm going to, then I have my short list. I, I've actually learned to make shorter, you know, like have a, a, a bigger list and then a shorter list. And I love being able to check things off, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. um, oh and then being able to re rework, you know, the list for the next day and recognize that I could work all day. I could work all night. There's always something to do. And it's, and in order for me to do that well, I need to, I need, I need sleep. I need water. I need, you know, nourishment. Um, I've been farming now for 21 years. My body has certainly screamed at me and said, you know, if you want to be able to keep walking down these stairs, <laughs> you know, you gotta think about stretching before <laughs> you do that, you know, and just, um, and some, yeah, so some of those ways that I've said, okay, this is a way I, I this is what I will um, do for myself came out of, you know, because I hurt myself or so, you know, so, but then I take that and say, okay, I'm not going to look at this acutely. I'm going to think about what it means to incorporate this into my life for, um, for maybe, for, you know, forever for, you know, for the long term and be able to reflect that back to others. Um, so a lot of it's like interpersonal, you know, becomes those, those more vulnerable conversations or vulnerable writing that I share with others. Um, not just having, you know, automatic responses, um, to things. Um, 
leaving space for those um, check-ins with my farm crew um, to, you know, be in that place of vulnerability often helps me to be able to name the success um, within mm -hmm. that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not to, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the structures that we're in, um, but uh, just speaking to, I think a lot of farmers have a hard time with self-care and mm -hmm. with, with those vulnerable moments um, because it takes away from the bottom line. You know, it's like, yes, there are 24 hours in the day. I need to spend all of them on my phone <laughs> doing farm work because it is not profitable to my business to right. take that extra half an hour to do those stretches that mm -hmm. I, I know will help my body. Or it's not profitable for me to take that hour out of my day and go to, you know, a group gathering of other farmers that sometimes happen um, because there's this work that needs to get done. So, you know, not to focus too much on like how to make our businesses profitable, but right. in reality, you know, looking at it in a holistic sense, how do these practices of self-care that you're talking about actually play into the, the longevity and the profitability and the, um, the, I guess, resiliency of our businesses yes. as, as independent business owners, uh, small business mm -hmm. owners that all farmers are, you know, like mm -hmm. that kind of has to be what, what it comes down to sometimes but I think a lot of farmers don't think in that mindset um so I'm not sure how that question is is put out there but does that make sense yeah, no, <laughs> can it you does. speak to that <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does I because I, I mean I can relate to it because I I remember thinking that way you know I remember thinking no I, I don't have time um, I don't, I don't have time to do yoga, for example, you know, for year I had before I was full-time farming, I had a very active yoga practice. And then I moved to a space of like, I don't have time for that, you know? And, um, and then, you know, and then I, I hurt, I hurt my back and all of a sudden I couldn't, you know, farm for a full week. Mm. And so I'm going, okay, so what kind of loss am I talking about if I literally, just lost a week, you know, in the middle of a farming season. Um, how is that profitable, you know, mm -hmm. to actually do that? It, it was a huge strain on on us to, to for me to um, be struggling in that way. And so, you know, I dialed back and said, okay, so maybe I don't have a half an hour. What if I have 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. And how about I start with 15 minutes of yoga? I'm using yoga as an example right now, but you know, 15 minutes of yoga um, or 15 minutes of stretching. And and so I made that commitment to do that. And because I was like, 15 minutes, I mean, come on, we can like think about what you could do. Think about think about the time that you spend on your phone. <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, like when we say we, ha we don't have all this time and now there's ways that, you know, you can measure on your phone actually how much time is being spent. So all those <laughs> excuses for, you know, saying I don't have time. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, I say, okay, I'm going to just commit those 15 minutes. What would that mean? And soon that 15 minutes became 20. Mm -hmm. And then that 20 minutes became 30. Mm -hmm. And I noticed for myself, and I was getting reflection back from, from my farm crew and from my children, just saying that like I my eyes looked brighter, or mm -hmm. I, it looks like I, you know, I I actually could um I didn't seem so distracted. I was staying more present, you know, those kind of that kind of feedback that was coming to me, I could feel in my body when I was broad forking that it didn't hurt anymore, you know, and that 
um, those subtleties were showing up and being reflected back in me in a way that both um, showed that it mattered not just to me, but it mattered to others, which ultimately then adds to profitability. You know, if I'm thinking about that, like I can show up as a better human, as a better, you know, farm manager, as a better, um, you know, person, then that ultimately is going to help the bottom line. Oh. You know, if we take 15 minutes to do a check-in as a farm crew even though it feels like, oh my goodness, we just, you know, like all seven of us are going to do a check-in. Okay. But then all of us feel more whole and we all feel more seen and heard. And then we're going to be able to do more in the field together because we actually are, you know, like bringing the humanity into our work. And, um, and then people want to come back here to work, you know? So I just feel like there's a circular aspect to it that, is beyond, um, you know, I think sometimes we're just, we're short-sighted in our thinking of, of, um, of that profitability. And so it's a, it is like a, it's a, there's a cultural shift that comes with it. And I mean, I use that example of, of yoga because I did, I literally, I think I started with like 10 minutes. I was like, maybe I'll do 10 minutes, you know, it was like that kind of thing. And then, and now I, you know, solidly commit to at least a half an hour, if, if not more. And, and if I don't do that on a given day, well, certainly my children will notice. And most of the time my father will not <laughs> like, did you, did you do that yoga today? <laughs> you know? So that shows to me as profitability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to take the moment to to recognize, um, you know, what we're putting out there of even taking 10 minutes, that can be hard to start, like, very hard, you very know, hard. we're yeah. not saying it's easy to just say, okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes of yoga every day now. Yeah. It's a, it's hard. It's hard because it's changed to our habits. And as we all know, as stubborn farmers, habits are hard to break. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's like, there's the, um, and there's, there's all sorts of signs behind this of like, I think it's 20, is it 21 days? If there's uh, the two. It, it varies. It could be 21 days. Some people say 40 days. Yeah. There's no. to be able to change. I have you know it's like that a minimum of two weeks mm. um you know that where and and it, it it it's so hard it is so hard to get through those first you know few weeks of of commitment it helps a lot I found to have an accountability partner mm. in some way where you know um again going back to the yoga example you know just like I'll send a text to to my friend and say that, you know, I did it. And so like that kind of um, having somebody else or talking to another farmer, um, you know, and saying, okay, we're going to work on these, these accounting things together. The fact that there's a group of people, you know, um, a dedicated space like that, that's amazing. That's the accountability, right? So then everyone's doing that work together in a space. They don't feel isolated. They don't feel shameful. Or if they do, they get to support each other in that. And then all of a sudden, you know, over a course of, re it's not that much time. So say it's like within a month, we create these new habits and it becomes something that, um, can be sustainable over time but those initial date oh my goodness it's hard it's really hard yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah it's really important not to be doing that alone yeah. um and again yeah. it kind of comes back again to the you know the successes part like if you yeah. commit to doing something to better yourself and you miss a day we're not focusing on that we're right. focusing on the successes of oh my gosh I stretched the last couple of times I did this after I broad forked, <laughs> for example, mm -hmm. and that's awesome. And I'm going to do it again, even though I missed this last time, I'm yeah. going to do it again and focusing exactly. on those successes rather yeah. than like, oh my gosh, I can't even get the, the taking care of myself, right? 
exactly. we beat ourselves up about that too yes it's oh it's so true how many things we can find to beat ourselves up i know <laughs> um, so uh well i want to ask just one more question before um we get to if there are any questions we have one question to to talk about in the question and answer area um, again, if anyone wants to put a question in, um, feel free to do that based on anything that we've talked about or haven't talked about. But one of the things that I really like to ask people is, is there something that you wished we'd talk about that hadn't, hasn't come up yet? Um, mm -hmm. Like, what have we not covered that is really uh, weighing on you that you're like, got to get mm -hmm. this out. Right. <laughs> um, actually, what, what I was, um, one piece that I was thinking of, but I, I did start touching about uh, upon this is just like that, that, that accountability partner piece. Um, I think, you know, I, I, now that I'm, now that I said it, I'm realizing just like how much that has impacted my life in a, in a positive way. And, um, and there's, um, oh my gonna Oh, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, there, I was just thinking of a, another, oh, another piece of it that, um, uh, which is also a habit change, but being able to say, um, focus on, you know, I was commenting about checklists of like the to do's and adding in those checklists, um, something, you know, p positive of, um, you know, like make a, write a note of gratitude or think of something that I'm grateful for in the day. I really do. I think that gratitude component is, is very, is both like very humbling and eye-opening and, um, helps to like break some of those, um, feelings of shame, you know, because I, I know even in my, in my hardest moments, if someone was to ask me, um, what I was grateful for, I, I have, I, I'm able to think of something, um, and it might feel mediocre in that moment, but, when I, when I'm able to like put, um, word to it or write that down, um, that gratitude piece is an amazing habit to build. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and maybe even that gratitude, you know, expressing gratitude is something that is done with a partner. You know, it's like, say something that, um, you know, say something that you're proud of every day, you know, check in, check in with a friend and, and say something that every day that, that, um, felt like a success or felt like, or maybe even name like a challenge and a success, you know? And so that, or give, cause it's always easier to, to say what was challenged or not done right, but being willing to match it with a success, um, I think is something that I know is something that's been helpful for me. But that I, um, but I would encourage others to participate in that as well. It seems like it seems kind of, I don't, I don't want to say cheesy, because <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I know for myself, you know, like as, um, you know, it's just we we have a privilege to to be walking on this earth. You know, we have a privilege to be stewards of of this land, and and we have a responsibility with that, and so being coming from a place of gratitude of everything that has um that the day offers is um a way to really start to shift that dial around success um and you know we've we've had a couple people drop off because the evening's getting later but i'm going to actually give us the opportunity to if you are um, willing to, um, you know, I encourage folks to drop in the chat, um, uh, what they do feel grateful for. Um, mm. it can be regarding your farm, it can be not regarding your farm. And, you know, let's practice for a moment, <laughs> like being mm. grateful mm. and feel free to put it in chat. Um, I will speak to a weakness of mine right now. This is my first time using Zoom webinars, so I don't know if everyone can see the chat or not. <laughs> but 
um, that are the people that are not panelists. <laughs> so um, the chat uh, cannot be seen by people watching the webinar. It only goes yeah. to the panelists. Yeah. So if you would like to um, put in the chat what you are feeling uh, gratitude about, um, I will be happy to read those out. Um, but I wanted to uh, speak one thing that, that someone said um, that they heard a quote today in another workshop that we need to stop thinking like farmers with our plans being annual, one growing season and start thinking like foresters and thinking in decades. Mm. And you think about what you can achieve with 15 to 20 minutes a day of self-care stretching or rather what can keep you from happening such as injury over a decade. So um, mm. yeah, thank you for for sharing that friend. Uh, and yeah, there is so much uh, that our little uh, actions can build up to. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, one of the, the things that was also brought up is success sometimes feels like it's bound up with time. Um, we have short windows with farming sometimes, you know, seeding, transplanting, harvesting for those that are raising livestock, you know, there's a certain amount of time that you need to um, have births happening um, to be fattened up uh, for, for the processing of animals, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we're always working against that pressure of time. Um, and in, in essence, there does seem to be a perfect, perfect timeline of, mm -hmm. you know, especially our farming in the Northeast being limited by seasons. Right. Um, so I guess if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about that, like how do we deal with as farmers that that pressure of there are things that we yeah. have a small window to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that can, that can be a huge challenge. I know one of the things um, that I did because um, specifically around seed, so seeding specific um, certain crops um, as a vegetable farm, that's a, it's a huge, and, and part of the, um, we uh, specifically our farm on the scale that it's at, we have, we, we do a tremendous amount of success of crop production. So there is, there's seeding that's happening every week um, throughout the season. And so what I, um, I used to always feel like, okay, it has to be seeded on this date. And then I'd get really stressed that I'd be out there at like 1030 and I with a headlamp because it has to be seated on this date and then kind of laugh about the fact that like, okay, so it's an hour and a half before midnight, midnight, what does that mean? So, <laughs> you know, like, and so this is so silly. I could be doing this tomorrow morning after a good night's sleep. And so I, um, we have our, our seating schedule um, or a book that we, we always are keeping track of seating in. And so I looked at that, or a few of us looked at it um, and, and realized over a course of years, um, you know, we went through like five years of historical data and said, oh, actually there are like there are some windows that we have, you know, we have, it, it is short. It is like, it has to be done within this week. It has to be done within a four to five day period, but being able to identify that and name that actually took a huge amount of stress off mm -hmm. me um, or us, you know, um, I, I used to do all of the seating uh, pretty much alone. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I literally was like, I, I'm out there so late at night and then saying oh but last year I seeded it you know two days later oh. and so and it turns out that the harvest was you know just as good and so you know those kind of um recognizing those windows of time did help for me to like just pull back on that strain a little bit um the other pieces is just um 
going back to that space of gratitude is recognizing the the seasonality of our work Mm -hmm. and um and really um savoring the those seasons um and recognizing the the urgency that is there is very real and it's for a period of time and it's not something that i have to sustain for 12 months of the year Mm. and um you know a lot of people that are in my lives know that you know winter comes and it's like okay it's my play space you know like I get to Mm. (laughs) it's time to be able to you know hang out and to you know um bring those like longer stretches of social time together um because I can't necessarily do that, you know, in June. And so um, those kind of things, the seasonality of our work has really, uh, not even, but recognizing those, um, those shifts within the season has helped with some of that, that urgency for me. Um, and then one more question, just in regards to, um, again, I mean, the biggest stressors are, I think, for, t- for farmers are time and money. <laughs> to, I mean, there are a lot of them, obviously, but the ones that we probably think about most consistently are time and money. And weather. Um, and weather, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I guess if you'd be willing to talk about a little bit, like, what was that process? um like for you this is based on a question in the chat of figuring out how to hire people Mm. um, and coming to that point because like it's it's just it feels like a huge huge step when you feel like you're scraping to make ends meet and just come out break even yeah yeah um yeah that's so real it's so real. Um, I think, well, I know for our farm, the way that we were able to both, you know, bring in um, people and, and then continue to um, increase the amount of people that we have working with us has been through fine tuning our systems of farming. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really, you know, we, um, we are looking at a given, you know, square foot of space um, and saying it's not just fine tuning systems, but, you know, for vegetable production, recognizing which ones, um, I, you know, I want to say more profitable, but, you know, we don't, we actually don't focus on, a lot of people will focus on um, high-end microgreens, for example, you know, and that's like, that's actually one we, we hardly do any, we have, Actually, we really don't do any of that anymore. But we think of, you know, um, we, a combination of crops that have like some that have a quick turnover, some that have um, a longer season stay, and that those kind of learning like what our market is, um, having the balance between wholesale and CSA has really helped us. Um, we have these like standard crops that we do really rely on for wholesale that enables us to maintain a steady income that's supplementing the CSA. And so, you know, that's some, those are systems that we've designed over time. And so we didn't go from just, um, you know, the two of us to eight of us, we went, you know, it was like, oh, we had one person come on and then we had then, um, you know, another person. And so it was over a course of many years um, that we did that. And we're really intentional about, you know, we don't rely on, on interns, or apprenticeships. Um, we, we, um, and we have been increasing our, um, our pay rate and it's really scary um sometimes you know it's like um we also have been we put we focus a lot on the quality of our products so it's not so much about like an immense output um but the the quality of our product is really good so we get a higher dollar value for the food that we're producing than some other farms do because literally you know, the wholesale accounts that we work with, they have no shrink. They like the product sells itself. It's like out the door, you know, in no time. And so we're able to get a higher dollar value because we're taking the time in the field to, um, 
to really care for for the land for for our crops um, so that we can ask for a higher dollar value so I mean these are I do workshops about this you know it's definitely I'm just trying to give like little snippets of it yeah, but it you yeah. know the 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 care for the care for the for the product itself and the and the 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 systems that um, we have in place have enabled us to be a little more certain and also having a mixed um, a mixed market you know because with our the CSA you know that's a guaranteed um, market our wholesale accounts we have long-standing develop relationships within so we're never growing more than what um, either one of those audiences need, um, which goes back to our successive planning. And um, over time, you know, we've been able to create a more steady income um, and and working with our, with our accountant, mm-hmm. you know, being able so that our accountant can see, oh, actually like this, this is, you know, there's a growing point that's here. What if we actually worked, you know, on, consolidating some funds at this time so that you can actually pay somebody at that time. Um, and that's, you know, just being in a more creative, like open space uh, conversation with others right. about that. Right. Um, yeah. And I also want to speak to like, again, I feel like this comes a little bit to reaching out. Um, yeah. So For example, I know of a farm where occasionally they will send an email out to their CSA members and be like, hey, we have a lot of work on the farm today. If you would like to come and volunteer, you are more than welcome to. Um, You know, I I mean, there's always uh, there's always a balance like people need to be paid for their labor. But there's also some people out there that are excited to help that want to see you. Uh, succeed and thrive Mm -hmm. and that you know would love to come out and be on the farm obviously sometimes volunteers take a little bit of extra time so you have to balance that (laughs) (laughs) but at the same time you know it's it's taking the moment to say hey this is this is my reality as a farmer yeah Uh, I have all this to do and I would love if my community would, if they have the time and willingness, come yeah. on over and help me out. Mm-hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Thank you for reflecting that. I think that it's a really good point. I mean, it goes back to that general, um, um, that general, I, I, what I would advocate for is just asking for help in general, you know, of just like whether it's, you know, to, um, to an accountant or to the entire community, you know, it's like being in that authentic space saying, this is really hard right now. Um, I could use some help or some, or even just a, a soundboard, or I could, you know, if anyone, um, those positive notes that somebody might send. I mean, there's been times where I have, I haven't said directly, like, please send me a note, but I will just be able to like name the fact that, that I, or we are having a hard time, you know? And, and so being able to name that, being able to be more vulnerable in those spaces to ask for help and just remember that none of us are meant to be doing this alone. So, you know, what I've learned over the years and and really continuing to learn is that people, people want to help. They don't necessarily know how, or they, but they just need to be asked, you know, when we, when we've had, you know, tremendous strains from, from weather in the past, you know, I mean, somebody showing up with like muffins is just, you know, it's such, so heartwarming, you know, just little, it's those little acts of care that, um, that we open ourselves up to when we say, you know, I'm having a hard time right now. Um, and because otherwise people don't know, they just think that we're these like rock stars that are, you know, just <laughs> that can work 70 hours a week yeah. and still right. have a smile on their face. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, seeing as we're close to time, I just wanted to take a moment, first of all, to thank you, Jen, because, um, not only for giving of your time, but also for giving of yourself. 
uh, I really appreciated you being willing to share personal things that mm -hmm. uh, you kind of went through and processed and modeling for us, like, what does that mean to be vulnerable, to, to tell the story of what's going on with your farm, with our farms, mm -hmm. um, and to not shirk from that uh, as if something bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for, for doing that and for giving us a part of, of you, really, mm -hmm. and, and your farm. Um, Secondarily, um, business. <laughs> I just dropped into the chat. There is a survey that we would very much appreciate if um, you all that are still on the call would be willing to fill out. Um, we will share some of this feedback with Jen. And also it helps uh, with giving feedback to our funders, the USDA. Um, and uh, Department of Ag so that we can do more of these, have more conversations and um, just everything. So um, really would appreciate you being able to take the time to fill out that survey. Um, we're also, uh, this has been recorded tonight. So we're gonna share this recording with you afterwards. Um, I am also going to share those resources that I shared in the chat in that uh, email, follow-up email. Um, so you have access to that. And if for some reason, Jen, you come up with some resources that you would like to share, we can also include those. Sure, um, yeah, I can, I'll drop in just now um, our, that's our website. Um, I'll give a unapologetic <laughs> um, <laughs> promotion of um, Woven Roots Farm. So you're welcome yeah. to check that out. Um, and um, there's an email list with occasional emails that come up. Our educational programming is expanding significantly. And a lot of what we'll be doing will be focusing on um, on wellness and, um, you know, reconnecting with land and each other. And so um, it's something that, and as well as being able to speak about, um, you know, the systems that we have in place, um, like I was just, you know, touching upon um, our specific techniques of farming and gardening in general. Um, so I hope that you stay in touch and I hope that there's another opportunity that I get to share with you in this really amazing community that you are building there in Connecticut. It's amazing to be able to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks again, everyone, for attending. 